Hello, it's me, Jess. Welcome to my channel. I'm here with another channeled message. This is a specific message. It might resonate with you. It might not. Okay, so I was reading the word prevalent and all of a sudden my brain started going prevalent, 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 prevalent. And I just knew that like it was a message or it was something that was trying to come through because I did remember that valent or like valence was a word. I'm pretty sure it's a science word and I'm pretty sure it's from chemistry, but I didn't really like chemistry all that much. So um, I had to look it up and a lot of the definitions for valence didn't really make sense to me, but one really stood out to me and I wrote that down. So valence is a relative capacity to unite, react, or interact. And I'm going to say that one more time just for me. Valence is a relative capacity to unite, react, or interact. Some of you could be dealing with a relative here, but again, this is prevalent. Whatever issue, I think you could be having an issue or an argument here with a person. And I think you've identified the problem as being a problem of your connection, but it's before all of that. It's prevalent. It's pre-connection, it is pre-relationship, and it is pre-communication. So this message, and I honestly feel a string of messages are kind of going to come out here behind this to help you sort through this kind of prevalent stage of the issue that you are having. Now, just to further um, make this clear, because I'm throwing around some big words here, <laughs> um, but when we think about like the Aries Libra axis, an axis always kind of works in tandem with with itself, there's a wholeness to an axis, right? So Libra on the one side of things is relationship. It is diplomacy, it's connection, it's um, back and forth. Now Libra is not the only kind of relationship dynamic we can have. And I do think that's important to point at, out here because if you can't identify the correct relationship dynamic, then you're gonna misunderstand how that dynamic should flow out. So another one is like Leo Aquarius where there's a leader and there's like a group, right? If the owner of the ice cream shop tells you you need to leave the ice cream shop, that's not a Libran dynamic. You need to go, right? Because that is a leader making a decision about their remit. Okay. So it's a different kind of, kind of a dynamic, right? Libran is different. And on the other side of Libra, we have Aries. So, um, Aries is always the self. It's the individual, right? So when we're saying that the issue that you're having here is prevalent, it's before relationship. It's a part of that Aries side of things for you, for yourself, and potentially for this other person, right? But there's a, a an issue within that person or within their mind or the way they're relating to things or the way that you are. And we really can only control ourselves in this. So I feel like you're being asked by spirit to just kind of go through a check um, within yourself. And it, even if you catch things where you're like, oh, I could do this better, it doesn't mean that you were bad at doing something to begin with. It just be, is that we're being asked to kind of take ownership and responsibility for ourselves, to learn more things about ourselves, and to use this experience um, as that. So I'm, this is kind of diagnostic is what I'm getting. Like they're, they're trying to help walk you through a diagnostic process within yourself so that you can better understand and pinpoint exactly what is going on. Okay. So as a part of this, like prevalent exploration, I am going to put a link in the description box below for another message. I think it came out yesterday. I never know when these messages are going to come out. Cause I just like, I've been channeling a lot recently. Um, I think it probably came out yesterday, but it's the one where um, I kind of explained that you and or this other person, it's like you might have these preconceived expectations of the dynamic and how you each think that this relationship or this conversation should go based on your upbringings. So that might also be playing a part here, but I'm not going to go into those dynamics in this message, but it could be like there could be messages for you in that as well. So I'll link that one below if you're interested. So, okay, starting to unpack this kind of prevalent thing, I feel like like a good starting point here is I feel like I'm being asked to ask you to consider that you might not know this person as well as you think you do, because you may be making assumptions here. Even if you can't catch that quite within yourself, you could be making some assumptions here based on your upbringing that the world around you, like this person um, is showing you are either outright false or they're, they're limited because they apply in some situations and not other situations. Right. And, or, the particular dynamic that you grew up in might have encouraged a false sense of self as a way of relating that was self per, per, um, self protective and um, performative in nature. And that could have gone on if you grew up away from this person. But for some of you, I feel like you could have grown up in the same family dynamic or like a very similar fam family dynamic or like a very similar culture where again, you kind of think that you both share certain understandings of things. Cause like maybe you both grew up Christian or you both grew up Muslim or, um, you both grew up Australian, you know, like whatever it is. So, um, but that just might not be the case because whatever culture you grew up in, 
and culture is a broad term, right? But um, might have actually encouraged that false sense of self to be presented. So yeah, you both got learned up real good on how you needed to protect yourself, which was kind of putting on a show. You knew which parts of yourself you could show, which parts of yourself you should not show in that group. So you may actually need to build that relationship with another person, even if you think you already have one because you just sort of learned the dance that you were supposed to learn, if that makes sense, okay? So I feel like we're throwing out some really confusing big topics here. Maybe, maybe not, but I hope that this is making sense. And also the song, um, Losing My Religion is playing in my head here as well. So, okay, getting kind of back to the pre's that we were talking about, right? Whatever problem that is going on here is actually pre-connection. It's pre-relationship, it is pre-communication. Cause I think whatever problem you think you ha are having here, I think you've identified it as a communication problem of sorts. So if you try to solve it there, you can't, and maybe some of you have tried to solve it there and you can't solve it. And you just kind of keep going around and around and you wonder why, and you are learning about yourself and maybe you're learning about communication. Maybe you've been learning uh, communication tips and tricks. Maybe you're using your I statements and you know, everything. And you just, you can't figure out like why something's not working, but also potentially, um, okay. We might have some noise here cause somebody's dropping off a package. I think I'm just letting you know. Um, Okay, so, but yeah, so it's not actually like a communication issue, it's before that, right? Okay, so the first thing that I wanna say about that, cause we're kind of unpacking this layer by layer is that not every problem you have with another person is a communication issue. It could be one. It could be one alongside something else, in which case this might actually be a much more difficult thing for you to unpack than you originally realized. But I do think for a lot of you here, this is not a communication issue that has been identified as a communication issue, meaning you, you communicate just fine, or like you do actually understand each other just fine. It's just that there's something else kind of getting in the way. But even if this is a communication thing and you, you know, you struggle to communicate with this person in particular, that they struggle to communicate with you. I don't think it's a communication issue first. I think there's something here that has to be unpacked and then you can work on the communication issue. It's not something you can work on together, which might make you feel uncomfortable. And if that might be an obstacle for you. So you might have to kind of acknowledge the fact that not communicating with this person makes you feel uncomfortable and that you're trying to feel like an emotional need to communicate with this person, even though you kind of do understand that it's not the correct order of operations, you know, to actually like solve something here. So the other thing is, um, Communication is more than just the words that you say. And I know a lot of us have that understanding, but it's worth like repeating here because of course, like we have, you know, tone of voice and facial expressions, your body language, all of that, but also communication is an on-ramp. And what I mean by that, it's not like a straight line where the moment you start communicating with someone, you're communicating at peak performance with them. There's like an on-ramp and some relationships that you have, the on-ramp is going to go deeper and much more intimate than other relationships that you have. And that is as it should be in my opinion. Um, but if we look at it like that as communication is an on-ramp, um, it's kind of like, I'm not trying to be weird, but it's kind of like a courtship. It's kind of like a mating dance in and of itself, where as you're kind of getting to know someone through their communication, right? So there's the thing you're communicating like, oh, well, I like tennis or, you know, I like whatever, um, barbecues. Um, there's like the thing that you're saying, but there's also the way that you're saying it. There's like a communication hygiene that people have. And so that's kind of subtext, right? And you're kind of pay paying attention to both of those things, right? Like how somebody communicates is just as important as what it is that they're communicating. And so you getting to know a person is like, you're getting to know them in that very holistic way. So there's kind of that um, mating dance where both people get to demonstrate that they have pro-social cooperative kind of values. Now cooperation, and I, this is like a theme, a central theme of the messages that I channel is that so often girl or boy, whoever you are, we all say these words, right? And we know what they mean. It's just that words have kind of holistic meanings in and of themselves. They can mean like a lot of different things and we are applying them differently. Or we actually, I mean one thing when I say cooperation, you mean another thing when you say cooperation. And if you feel like there is a communication issue, if you ever do get to that stage where you are communicating, that might be just a good little tool to have in your back pocket to, if you find that things are going off the rails, just identify like, okay, well, um, what, what is, what is, what do you mean by that? You know, by that particular word and like really give them space to um, describe it because you might be able to, again, go diagnostic with it and be like, Oh, okay. Because like, I'm, I'm trying to talk about this and you think I'm trying to talk about that, you know, and that's um, the issue that we're having here. But cooperation for me, 
there's cooperation the intention which i honestly in my heart of hearts feel like most of us have most of the time i think most of us really are trying to cooperate we're trying to understand and to be understood but there's also cooperation in the skill set and we do vary on how skillful we are at being able to communicate with each other and bring about cooperation in different settings in different environments um, and i always go back to the four agreements with stuff like this because one of the four agreements is always do your best but understand that your best is always going to change like if you're sick if you're tired if you're at your wit's end, um, you know, if you're, if it's finals week, like your best is going to differ, you know, and that's a normal thing. And it's just good to know that about other people and to also know this about yourself, right? But there's cooperation, the intention, and there is um, cooperation, the skill set. And cooperation, the skill set, isn't somebody just that says, well, I'm trying to be cooperative here. It's somebody that can actually demonstrate in the process of their um, communication and their relationship building that we can have whatever conversation we want about whatever it is that we're trying to say, but they'll never drop the cooperative part. That's their priority. That's their baby. They tend that in the conversation with you. And there could be a misunderstanding about what that means as well, because you can speak in your strong voice. You can be assertive. You can be matter of fact. Um, you can be passionate even and still maintain that cooperation. But that's where it gets like kind of nuanced and there should be some communication on what's acceptable and what feels okay and what, what if there are lines crossed and you know things around that as well but um those are other i feel like hairy points in maybe like the the cooperative um thing here overall so what i'm trying to say is like why this isn't a communication issue is because there might not have been an on-ramp that was at all because even if you grew up in the same family as somebody and you were expected to like put on a face and performative and maybe you don't have the relationship that you need to you know so maybe in terms of communication it was this kind of touchy feely touch and go i'm not going to drop my mask you don't drop your mask because we don't know what happens it's like uh you know columbus is he gonna sail over the earth girl and maybe he should have huh <laughs> i'm kidding joke no i'm not um <laughs> uh, he was not a very good person look it up anyways um you know it's like before the europeans discovered the americas because the Americas were discovered, honey, there was people here. But um, then people thought, oh, well, if you just keep sailing, you're just going to fall right off of the planet. <laughs> you know, it, it can feel like that when it's like, I was only taught this way to communicate. And I was taught that I have to wear this facade. And if I drop it, am I just going to sail right over the edge? I don't know what's on the other side of that, you know. So um, it could just be that there needs to be a relation. What I want to say is like, some of you, I think, need to repair the relationship. And for some of you, I think you've got to build one in the actual first place before you can have this conversation. And yes, that is going to take longer. And yes, that is actually right and good. Because the ego, I think, maybe wants to rail against that. Because the ego wants to have the conversation and wants to have the conversation now, right? But the reason that this is all as it should be is because there's a priority check that's built right in there because God is cool and God is awesome and God is holistic and God is well-rounded and God knows what he is doing. But there is this, there's this priority check. There's this intersection that is this priority check. And I think there's, that's where we also split off here with this group because I think there's somebody here that knows that on some level, they know that even if they wouldn't just be like, and there's a priority check here. And on some level, they know that. And they handle with that kind of like understanding. And then there's somebody here who doesn't. And I think this may um, account for a difference in social emotional intelligence, which we'll just put to the side here um, for a second, but we'll kind of circle back around. But what I mean is the way you approach this conversation, how quickly you go in for it. If you try to rush an intimate conversation, if you try to go into a place that maybe a person isn't wanting, ready or willing to show or go with you and you don't give them that choice and you're just trying to rush that ball over the end zone, then you are kind of showing that your priority is the conversation and your priority is whatever the conversation, what, whatever you think that the conversation is going to get you or whatever you think the conversation is going to lead to. In other words, you are your own priority and all those things are kind of lumped together, right? I'm rushing the conversation because I'm rushing what I think it's going to get me and I'm, I'm my own priority here. My feelings, my discomfort, my, um, my wants in the situation, which is why I'm not giving you time to reflect. Why, that's why I'm not honoring your boundaries. And I'm telling myself that's all well and good because if we can just get across the finish line, it's very anxious attacher actually. Now, this there's another approach, right? Where you're rebuilding the relationship first and you never, never bring up that conversation that you want to have until you feel like your relationship can handle it, until you feel like there's trust and you're getting consent every step of the way. Hey, um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I would like to actually talk about this certain thing, the elephant in the room, or this certain thing that like happened in the past. And I know it might be a touchy sub subject for both of us. And so 
I would like to go there. How do you feel about going there? You know, would that be something that you're open to? Like, and you know, like now, or maybe in the future, do you think we could ever get there? See how it's like, you're positing that it's so respectful. And it's again, like you're rebuilding that relationship. You're demonstrating, demonstrating your cooperatability. You're not just saying I'm cooperative and then trying to rush the ball over the end zone. You're saying I'm cooperative. And then your actions are actually demonstrating the fact that you are cooperative and that you've made room for the other person. Because if you take that approach, it's clear that your priority is the relationship between the two of you. Your priority is this, this other person. Your priority is their comfort because you can't separate any of those things, right? So it's this kind of very cooperative, non, um, non like selfish approach. And I keep wanting the, to compare this to Schmegs in my brain, like um, the act of like, you know, warming somebody up. I don't want to say certain words, but um, you know, it's like, you don't just want to go right for it. You know, some, you're gonna hurt somebody. And maybe um, that is a variable here. Somebody could have rushed that um, into that with this person or um, with somebody else here, or, um, or it could just be a metaphor for intimacy as well. Um, but there's different perspectives on that, right? Like there's people who think that Anyways, I don't want to get off topic. I think that could actually be like a major factor here though. Um, so you're crossing this intersection and you've got to know that you're crossing that intersection and you want to cross it right, girl, because there's a camera at this intersection. Because I do think somebody here has that kind of social emotional intelligence and that's where we can kind of circle back to that because I do think that somebody here may actually be intimidated by someone's intelligence in a certain area or it might be their social emotional intelligence. And so they could be compensating with their emotions by, um, and it's a way of trying to wrangle control. Well, I feel this way. And it's, a, it's not, it's not sharing emotions at that point. It's not just, well, I need you to know how I feel. Cause I think that again, that lack of social emotional intelligence is going to have that person who can't kind of hang on an intellectual level, which is fine. We all have our different, um, talents and strengths, right? But it's going to have that person who can't hang on an intellectual level overcompensating with the emotions and just kind of ramming their emotions down somebody else's throat, which is not a good feeling. There could also be someone who, again, they don't have the social emotional intelligence to know that somebody who's bringing up certain things is not going to do that because they know better than to do that. Um, you know, but I think that it's, that's actually emotional tyranny. It is somebody being a tyrant. It is someone hogging all the space in the room where they just keep asserting their emotions because somebody else has emotions too. And I think that the answer is actually in the, the queen of swords kind of intelligence, intellectual side of things because you're being asked to know more. And I think that's what this um, series is about because you can always know more, right? Um, and usually people who already know certain things, they don't get intimidated or offended or triggered when you say like, well, we can always know more. Let's just double check and make sure that we're fine um, because they feel kind of confident in themselves. So just these are things to just kind of be aware of. But I think for one person here, it may well be that they need stronger intelligence. And when they learn that stronger intelligence, they may feel remorseful. They may understand. This is kind of like, okay, well, I'm seven years old. And the universe is asking me to turn eight and I need to turn eight because when I turn eight, I'm going to understand the wisdom of an eight year old. This is totally an example. <laughs> um, this is a loose metaphor. And I understand why I do things like an eight year old does things now and not the way I was doing them when I'm seven. And that actually changes the conversation. And again, someone confident and secure in themselves and who cares about the other person and who cares about the relationship over their own ego is going to be able to then apologize and say, and, and to be able to say, look, girl, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. Forgive me, Lord, for I have sinned. I knew not what I did. And I just want to throw this in just in case social emotional intelligence is a thing. When you're apologizing is not the time to justify your behavior. It's not the time to make excuses. You let that apology sit there, girl. You sit in that uncomfortability. You just sit and you say, I am sorry. And you just sit there and you just listen to them. And that is the time for that. And if in the future it matters to them to hear, you know, and you can even say like, well, you know, I had my perspective and I realized the flaws in it and, um, it is something that I bear. And if that's something you're interested in knowing why I did what I did, then I'm happy to have that conversation as well. But just know that with that person that you wounded, it might not be the right place for you to air that out. It might be with a therapist, it might be with a friend, it might be with yourself in your journal to understand like, well, I wasn't trying to mess up, but I did, right? But then it would change the conversation. And for some of you, that's that prevalent quality where it should, the conversation should be an apology and you can't get there unless you grow in social emotional intelligence or potentially those energies are flipped and you would already know that, I'm sure if that's the, the case. Now, the last thing that I kind of want to bring this to is that if you're rushing the conversation, again, like you just have to have this particular conversation here with this person, okay? And they're not comfortable with you and they have not invited you into that space. They have not demonstrated that they believe you to be an authority or somebody that they would like to consult on this issue, but you insist on 
pushing yourself into that um, role for this person. Anyways, you have to ask yourself why, because again, you're, you're running right through that checkpoint and it's reading as like some kind of evangelical attitude. That's what's coming through. Okay. Evangelical attitude. And I know that evangelism is something that we very much associate with religion, which might be another variable here. Um, again, I'm hearing that song, losing my religion, but, um, that evangelical. Okay. So I'm not meaning evangelical attitude as like necessarily being religious, although take this however it's resonating, but evangelism, an approach of evangelism is inherently non-cooperative and it is inherently disrespectful. And I'm not asking you to take my word on that. I'm asking you to spend some time with it. Think about what that means because the perspective of evangelicalism, and I think I'm demonstrating something for you here, right, as well, where I'm putting out my perspective. This is actually a place in my brain that I have run many times and I've paid lots of money to sit in certain classes and to hear a lot of different people talk about these kinds of things. And I'm not saying even that like, I, I know that I have the truth with a capital T, but I'm pretty certain about what I know. And I'm going to tell you why I know it. And then I'm just going to let you chew on it. And I want you to chew on it because I don't want you to just believe what I'm saying. Right? So, um, there's, I think a bit of a demonstration in this as well, but I'm still speaking in my strong voice. Right? So for me, having that evangelical attitude is inherently uncooperative because it says, I have not just an opinion, but I have the opinion, which, uh oh, right now we've got a person with an agenda and somebody with an agenda is an inherently an unreliable narrator. And this kind of goes back to, there is absolutely a difference between having a belief and being indoctrinated. And I, I kind of think that it's, um, and this, this shows a difference in approach as well, because personally, I think beliefs are beautiful um, and they add so much meaning to life. And we're all here trying to make sense of our reality. But the altar is within each of us. And I just feel that that's a place that you do not tread on most people unless you are invited in there. I think it's disrespectful to God, girl. Um, but anyways, um, I think that each one of us with our beliefs, we have to go through our own deconstructive process because that is... Uh, an intimacy process with ourselves. We have to know why we believe the things that we believe. We have to let go of beliefs that actually, when we poke around in there, they don't make sense for us. And that's such an intimate process. I would actually argue that you are not fit to have a conversation. You are not fit to have a debate with someone unless you have patiently gone through a deconstructive process with yourself and you have fully considered that you are wrong in every opinion and every aspect that you have taken. You try to prove that true. That's the scientific approach, right? That's how scientists approach theories. They try to prove them wrong. That's called critical thinking, right? You are critical. You are your own worst enemy to the theory you believe in most. You wanna prove it wrong because you are above all else loyal to the truth. And if you can prove it wrong, you'll prove it wrong. And then you will sit in the void or you will change your opinion, right? And go through the same process. Somebody here does not share that belief, I think, for some of you. Um, because this person, like if they are taking this evangelical attitude where it's, you've got to believe what I believe because I have the opinion. It's kind of this righteous rescuer stance in the victim, rescuer, persecutor triangle, which if you are on that triangle at all, you occupy all of those roles. And usually someone who is evangelical and who thinks that they have the opinion and that they're rescuing you and everybody else with their opinion and their superiority, they persecute people. I mean, this is this is the history of Christianity. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I myself am Christian. I, I'm a follower of Christ, but I, I follow him, girl. And I followed him right the fuck out of the Bible. And I realized that the Bible is the biggest idol known to man. And if you cannot differentiate between those two things, and I'm not trying to get evangelical. This has just been my own journey, right? And I think that some people can't separate out like their beliefs or, you know, actually have opinions like that, you know, that are maybe different than mainstream. Um, and I'm not trying to start a war. I'm really not. <laughs> I really don't care what you think. Um, or like what opinions or beliefs that you have, because I myself identify with so many different groups. And I think that a lot of people who haven't done their own deconstructive process don't understand how I can identify myself as being a little witchy and being a um, Vedic and being an astrologer. And it's because I look for God in everything. I think if you go deep enough in anything, you'll find God. You will just find him because that's where she is, girl. That's where he is, girl. He's just in everything. Everything is expressing that. Um, but I'm not trying to make this about me and I'm not trying to make this about my beliefs, but I am just saying that if you go across the world at the tip of a gun and tell people to switch their religion and to believe, to change, is that the method by which you change hearts and minds? No, it's not. It's disrespectful though. It is that. And it's persecutorial though. It is that. And people who can't understand their method is wrong. 
Their method lacks heart. It lacks self-awareness. It lacks respect. They are not a person who is safe to have a conversation with. But, a, but just a person who's passionate is different. I think I demonstrated that here just as well. Um, yeah, uh, it automatically basically places a person in a lesser position. And this is actually different than a persuasive argument because it does take a persuasive stance, evangelicalism. But I, I think it's more tyrannical than that. I think it's more authoritarian than that because persuasive arguments, I kind of think about like persuasion when you put it in the context of true debate. I'm not talking about like, I'm talking true debate like, where there's rules, there's um, like regulations, because in a true debate, you kind of are just assigned a side, I'm pretty sure. Um, and you are supposed to research that side like your life depends on it, and you're supposed to defend it like your life depends on it. It's kind of like this is the fundamental basis or should be of like the court system as well. Like the two sides need to argue because they're both in service of the truth. But evangelism is like, well, I've picked my side and I want my side to win. And there's like an emotionality in it. It's not, oh yeah, well, this is what I think is true, so I'm going to vehemently argue this. But if it proves itself to be an un, like, uh, if it proves itself not the correct argument, if it falls flat in the face of truth, I have to let the truth prevail because God is truth, you know? Um, but we all have to be in service of the truth, you know? Um, so there's that emotionality in that evangelism. It is the, the picking of a side before, you know, even in the face of, like, being shown wrong, you know? Um... And that comes down to power, basically. It comes down to power and power is always about you. And I think some of you, this is a focus on yourself as having power, as having the truth, as having as sh the one who should be the leader. But I think for others of you, you associate with power. You believe that you have the establishment behind you. You, have, you believe that you have the backing of the family or you have the backing of the religion or you have the backing of the government and therefore you're going to steamroll or another person. And if they think you should not do that, then they will bow to your authority. It probably, and for some people, these would be the most annoying people. These would, they're going to bring in the hammer behind them. They're going to be the face of sweetness. And when that doesn't work, they're going to feel victimized because they're on that victim, persecutor, rescuer triangle. They're going to feel victimized and they're going to feel totally justified running to somebody that they feel like is an authority with, a, with an edge, um, with a hammer. And they're going to hammer you out of existence. This is violence. And this is hypocrisy. It is a... Going, I am kind of, li I'm listening to this in, through the lens of religion. I think this could be, um, could be a, a factor here. Or zealot, I'm just hearing the word zealot, somebody who is, has a zealot belief of something that maybe is not religion, but they kind of uh, relate to it as though it is a religion. Um, yeah, and dang, I just like forgot what I was completely going to say. But um, they, yeah, they just, there's this zealot attitude here um anyways i don't think for everybody this is religion i'm just kind of there could be somebody here at least it's like they have this evangelical attitude or they think that they're like and they don't they can't see that about themselves or they can't see that it's wrong um so or they can't see why other people don't want to have conversations or relationships with them because they just steamroller people and people don't want to be steamrollered. <laughs> they want to be respected. And that is the authority in this situation on the Libran axis. Because Aries, because you're, you are on equal footing. And evangelism, there's something here where it's like, I want to come in and I want to speak the language of equal footing. Let's just have a conversation. But they don't mean that. They actually mean, I think I'm an authority. They, they think that they're having a Leo Aquarian conversation and I will lead you to the truth. You know, kind of thing. Um... But they're not being respectful about that. They're not, because Aries kind of authority is, I have authority over my own self, my beliefs, my opinions. And even if you were to threaten me, I still could not change my belief. I could lie to you and tell you my belief has changed. But if you cannot go, like, if you cannot honor the fact that I'm going to make my own mind up or that I have my own values, that is um, anti-Christ, anti-humanity, um, anti-love. And like Jesus said, first remove the log from your own eye. So anyways, I think this has got really religious, like here at the end. And I, I, I don't know. Um, I think it's because there's an attitude here that someone takes that 
it actually might be religious, but it's not religion. It's something else that they, that has become their religion or their savior. And I think it should be your savior too, or potentially this is your position. I don't know. So anyways, I'm just going to leave this there. Um, I do think that I'm going to have some other messages that kind of channel through me here to do with this like prevalent. And I'll just reiterate here that the problem you think you're having with a person is prevalent. It is before the connection. It's not, a, it's before the relationship. It's before the communication. It's within self. Um, and that you need to kind of under, unpack your, your own perspective and your own processes and do that kind of deconstructive work here in order to understand and kind of bridge a gap here or even determine whether or not a relationship is fit or a certain conversation even needs to be had here. And that's seeing through the lens of wisdom is what I'm hearing. So um, I'm going to leave that there. Thanks for listening. If that resonated, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Bye, guys. <laughs>